I left school at 15 year old and got a job um, at the British Rail offices adjacent to Dunstan Stays, which is the big wooden pier where they load the coal onto the ships. Mm. Um, the job was messenger boy. I used to pick up all the mail at the office in the morning. I had to be there by six. And then I used to have to distribute mail walking along the railway track from Dunstan Stays to Bladen, dropping them off at each signal box, picking their mail up and bringing it back. And then I would collect more from the officers, and my job then was to get to Marley Hill, um, again walking. But what I used to do was hook a lift on the engine. If, if an engine was passing in the direction I wanted, I would jump on them and jump off when I wanted to. The train drivers didn't like it, but <laughs> I don't think they were that bothered. And then I used to use the gravity haulage system to get from Dunstan up the Marley Hill. Um, the gravity haulage system is quite simple in that um, a cable passes around a big drum at the top of a hill and on one end is all the full trucks of coal and right down the bottom end is the empty trucks. The brakesman takes his brake off, the wheel starts rotating and the weight of the full trucks going down pull the empty ones up to the top. So I used to jump on either the back or the front and get a lift up and uh, then an engine took it along the flats to Watergate and we had the same system, gravity haulage. I often used to sit on the front with the bank rider and when I look back it was horrific, I, I don't know how we got away with it. The bank rider just sat on the front with a handle like that and I used to sit next to my hand, 15 year old on that, and there was the big wire cable connected to the engine with a type of clip with a pinion and we used to sit there chatting all the way up. To fall off was instant death. No ifs or buts, if, if we fell it was dead. And when you reached the top of the incline and it started dropping down, he would then pull the pin out, hit the clamp with the hammer, the rope would go one way and then we used to both jump off and go the other way. And in the winter we used to roll over. That, that was it. I suppose the men would have had a problem if anything had happened to me. But we used to do that, 15 years old, and I would drop the mail off en route and wherever there was a flat I would get a lift from an engine along to the next hill and all the way to Marley Hill and then back down with the same system, getting on with the bank raider and uh, back to the offices at Dunstan and then I had to then pick up mail and walk along the town bank and up across the town bridge and drop the mail off at the central station and that was the end of the day, I was allowed to get a bus um, from their home and I used to get a written bus pass and hand it in and uh, get a bus home to where I lived at Sunnyside. And then uh, when I was a few months older, they put me up on the stairs and my job then was to, I was a switch lad and I had to send the sets of coal trucks to the relevant bay for, to put on the ships. And my job was just to alter the rails, it would go that way to one bay, to the other. It was horrendous in blizzards. It was absolutely freezing cold. Um, so I, I didn't go much on that, and I decided that it was time to leave and find uh, a fresh field. How did you get your job at the railways? Well, I had a friend I was at school with, and uh, he left slightly before me, and jobs were hot, pretty hard to find. Um, at that time, despite what people think now. And he came in and said, there's a job available down at Dunstan Stairs where I work, do you want to come down? And I said, yeah, no problem. So I got the bus down and um, they took me straight on immediately. So that, that basically is how my working life started. It's not the uh, what I chose to do. I wanted to be a journalist, but um, they were the days where the kids came second and um, I remember my mother and I've told my grandchildren, I'll never forget, the day I was going to school to set the exam where I would have moved on to grammar school and she said, um, don't get any fancy ideas about passing this, this exam and going to grammar school because your job's to get out there and get a job and help support this family. I thought nothing of it at the time but when I look back now um, I could never imagine we would say that to our daughter, but things was different. We had a big family, 
my father was on an old wage and um, he just went and done it automatically. But it wasn't what I would have wanted. But it uh, paid a wage and that was a £2.19 and a penny. £2.19 and a penny. And with that I even bought a bike to help me get about with the postage job. So there you go, the kids and I would die, wouldn't I? Two pound. And and what <coughs> what year was that then that you started? That was 1955. Right. And jobs were was it just round here then that jobs were difficult? I think just round here it um the major employer was the coal mines. And I didn't, I didn't really fancy that. I was not afraid of the hard work. But I just didn't fancy coal mining. All my family, with the exception of my father, um, were coal miners, my uncles. And they weren't very complimentary in what they said about it, but they said the mining uh, fraternity, if you like, were great. It was great working underground, your we old mates and everything. And that was true, you could see it in the pubs and clubs, how they stuck together. And if you went to a club on a Saturday morning, um, it would be full of miners off for the weekend. Uh, having a pint, and you could see them all over the bar. The, their arms were going and telling each other what work they're doing. And by the time you left, you were worn out. Uh, you worked a shift, you know. That, that was the only topic of, of discussion was the work and talking in terms. You know, I, I can't remember all of them. Talking about a good, good kettle, which was cabal actually, which meant they had some soft coal to get out. And, um, send the chummins in, the chummins was easy to get in, the empty tubs, you know, words like that which which will go. And uh, I'll, um, I think I stayed on the railway eight months before I moved on. Yeah. And, and do you moved on to Marley Hill Colliery then? Well, you? yeah, our, um, my father came in one Sunday night and uh, he said, you're not happy doing me, are you? I said, well, it's a job. Well, he said, be at the pit gates 8 o'clock on Monday morning, and Billy Kendall, who was one of the managers at Coal Mine, uh, said he'd take you on. So I had to be at the pit gates, and Billy was a great guy, safety officer and everything, and uh, he got me a job at Marley Hill Pit, which was one of the deepest coal mines in uh, the northeast. And Marley Hill Colliery was one of the biggest covered acres and acres. And, um, uh, I saw it again, I would rather not of, but when father said do, you did. Simple as that. He was ex army and still acted as a sergeant major. And uh, I'd, I'd done a couple of months training before I went underground, and then uh, he was showing how to knock props in to keep the roof up, and how to shovel coal, and how to handle pit ponies, etc. And then uh, that was it. And then it was down the pit you go. Do you mind if I have a drink? No, it sounds fine. I count. The kid didn't count. The eldest daughter was usually the lucky. Her job was to cook and clean and everything and get the mother an easy time. Mm. Uh, so we, we came last, but because of that experience, she had the same. We made sure that our daughter never had anything like that. Mm. <coughs> we give her everything we could. We, how many brothers and sisters did you have? I've got uh, one brother who's pretty ill at the moment. His prospects aren't good. And three sisters. Right. Um, so we lived in a slum when I was born in a slum, and it was a one up, one down, and it was like a little outhouse had one cold top in, and we lived there. I was about eleven year old, all of us. It uh, it was mice ridden off dreadful, and the toilets were in the middle of the field at the top, um, the ash mittens, and my father was a very strict disciplinarian and. I remember being tiny and frightened to go to the toilet because it was pitch black and he wouldn't take us up, said we were cowards and we had to go up on my own and sit in the pitch black and uh, on the toilet um, and then walk back down and get in the house. Can you imagine? Can you imagine doing that with yours? No. I can't imagine doing it myself. No. <laughs> well, that was, that was the way it, all, it, it was, you know. Um, but uh, do you want me to carry on with the coal mining? Just carry on. As you, I was just going to say, it was, was one at one down, and there were five yeah. children. Where did everyone sleep? Well, we all slept upstairs, the, the children, and my mother and father had a single bed under where the stairs went up, and they slept on that. 
and um, there was just one cold top and one it was a grotty little gas oven in the back. And uh, I remember in the mornings when she was making breakfast, if, if we could afford it, she would get the frying pan and they, they left dripping in them days because they would use it to put on bread mm. and salt. And every, every time you lifted one up, there was mouse prints everywhere. And it just used to go on the gas and melt it down, stick it. Then I threw it out. Um, I remember that specifically. You are just glad to get fed. Um, that was the way life was. And we all, uh, we all just piled into two beds. And with it being such a slum, you got problems with fleas and things like that. And I remember my father used to have a big pot of DDT powder and he used to pull the blanket and sprinkle the bed and sprinkle the blanket and we had to get in that. We had to climb in and sleep on that. It, uh, when you think back, I mean we'd be done for cruelty, wouldn't we? So did it give you lots of skin problems then? No, no, that's, that's amazing. What was so, probably so tough, you know, uh, um, we had to be, um, definitely. So it's a t totally different life, totally different. The, the houses are gone now, that street, Prospect Terrace. In fact, we use them for bus stops around, um, around the sunny side Whitton area. And uh, now it's luxury houses where we were. And I often go past and look and my God, wouldn't it have been wonderful, you know? Hmm. But, um, so when did you move on? Where did you move on to after well, that Well, we house? moved to council houses. Um, the, uh, <coughs> Somebody went, the, an uncle went to the council and said this was wrong the way we lived because um, my father wouldn't go down. He said, I'm begging to nobody, that was him. And uh, he went down and sent the man up and my mother was up at the shop and I was in on my own with the little ones. And he wasn't a nice guy and he come in and he said, show me round. I said, well, who are you? He said, I'm from the council, just show me round. So I had to take him upstairs, show him round. And he was took took and all the way, came down, and he wasn't so bad because within a month or so we we'll moved to a three bedroom house, which was luxury. It had a toilet, it had hot and cold taps. And we couldn't believe it, you know, moving into there. That uh, people deride council houses, but they shouldn't, because uh, it's a start. I like us. I mean, we we started with a council house when I left the Marines, went back into a council house, beautiful one, and then we sold it and uh, then moved over here just to be near my grandchildren to help out taking them to school. Because I, I did not want to come in a flat. But we had no other choice. Margaret was having to walk over from Sunnyside to get here for a quarter to eight in the morning for her daughter to leave. And it had to stop, so we moved here. Um, so go, going back to, um, to Marley Hill, yeah. you, um, when, when you first started there, how, how old were you then? I was uh, less than 16 year old. Right, and, <coughs> you, and you did your training and then did they send you, were you all, could you go straight underground or did you need straight to? Straight down. Right. Um, well, no, they gave a month on the screens, which was when the coal came up from the shaft, they would put them into a rollover, tipped them upside down, the coal went onto a conveyor belt and you had to stand in lines taking any stones off. It was called screening. And that used to be done by women. A photo of women standing there. Um, no gloves or nothing. Just great stones and everything. And then it was down the pit, um, which was horrific because it was um, a double cage. You had four men on the bottom, sat with your knees to knees like that, crunched in. And then there was four men on the top. And then the set of the way to the brook was seen and it bounced. Bounced and of course any little junior talks about into that pit and that's what it was a pit you were going down into a black hole in the ground you know and then when you got to the bottom you got out and the deputy met you and you were taken to the various jobs underground um, mine was timber leading at first you had a little tram fill it with the um, post for the men on the face push it along the rails, they would take the post off, you would go back and keep doing that all day, and that was timber leading. And then I got put on pony putting, which was where you had a pony, and the poor pony had what's called a limber on, and on the front of each uh, um, truck there was a, 
like a hook. You hook the pony on, off it went, and you have to get the full tubs out and bring an empty one in. So you are doing that all day. And they used to come off the rails, the full ones, and I mean, God, he was 16, I was pretty strong with getting them back on. My backs was in a hell of a mess. And the men from the face would come out if we shouted. Um, they weren't happy because they were peace work and but they helped with get them back on the rails and um, take them out and they were then put as a set to go out on a cable haulage and the cable haulage would take the full ones out, bring the empty ones in and that was the, the daily life. Um, then they moved to cutting, cold cutting with the big machines and that was on the face and there was a conveyor belt would come all the way out and the men at the face, the coal used to come from the cutter straight on and it would drop off the end into tubs. You had to keep shuffling forward for the tubs. And uh, they were tough men, I, I, I remember one. And he got cruelly called uh, the one on bandit. They called him Philip Snell. And he was a councillor. And he, uh, he was on the coal face. And the cutter had like a roller system and they had steel rakes when, when it locked. But Philip done that and it pulled his arm in and actually wrenched his arm out from the elbow. And of course it went with the coal. And all we heard was shouting and the belt was stopped. You had a long way all the way along. If you pulled that way anyway, it stopped that belt. And the deputy big Johnny Gooch, and he was big, came down with his deputy stick and the all ye lads get along that belt, he says, I want one every hundred yards and stand there. And uh, I said, well, well, why? Right, he says, you're looking for a norm. Exactly right. You're looking for a norm. It's Philip Snell's. He says, um, it'll come along the belt and whoever sees it, stop the belt, give me a shout and I'll pick it up. And right, he says, well, now there's a wedding ring on it. <laughs> so, one of the lads found the arm and uh, he went along and picked it up in the sack, brought it out, and then they brought poor Philip out, full of morphine, and he was on a tram like a stretcher, and they brought him out, and he had his, um, his bait bag on his chest, and on top of that was his lamp, which we carried here, and he had a cable went to your light. Because he was so well in, he had a spotlight, and if he had a spotlight, it was like gold. Most of us just had white. And one of the lads stepped forward and says, How are you feeling, Phil? And I said, Not well. Well, he says, You're finished here. He says, You'll never need that lamp again. So he took his lamp. And then a bit, this is true, a bit further on, Kelly Little had called him. <laughs> he stepped forward and says, Phil, are you all right? And Phil says, not really, Kelly, he says. I'll be, I think I've had it. And Kelly says, well, in that case, you'll not need your, need your bait film. And he took his bait. <laughs> he took his bait. And then they had to push him out on the rails all the way out, a couple of miles. And uh, that, that was the way they were. They weren't unkind, but they were, they were tough cookies, you know. Because mm -hmm. I, I got hit by a fall of stone when the, the pony, um, they gave me a young flighty one. Oh, I was, I could, it was awful. And it used to jump up and down and the, the pulled the trucks into the timbers, the timbers fell out and I had a fall down on top of us. And I was lying there wondering what the hell to do and here the deputy came along, little Bobby God is about that height, and he came along and he says, uh, are you all right? I said, well not really. I said, I feel pretty rough. So he went, got some of the men out, got a stretcher, and they carried me all the way out on that stretcher, the four men, sometimes up hills like that underground. And we got to the bottom of the shaft. <coughs> I said, well, thanks, lad, and I started to get up. And, uh, Eddie Irwin was one of them. He said, if you want to be a real bloody casual, you'll get up from there. You stay where you are, because once we are on bank with you, we are allowed home. And I was still lying on the stretcher that took us in the first aid office and then walked out. And then I got up and I was all right, I just had a couple of bruises. But they got a sharp lows they called it. And uh, we, weekends were spent with them, evenings, we were great comrades, we drank together, laughed together. And 
I still talk to them now and uh, we meet, we're running out on one of the oldest now. We couldn't find anybody to do an aviation work on the ground memorial pit. And I ref I'm recording again. Right. Um, just b before you said about it being one of the deepest, was it yeah. one of the deepest seams yeah, in the, the area? How, how deep was it? Oh, I can't remember. Right. I could tell you looking it, looking it up, but um, it, it was recognised as one of the biggest and deepest. Um, it, in fact, it had two shafts. And when I take people up now to see it, I've got to do a tour for Central Library next week, I think. And then the following day, I'm taking the school children from Marty Hill School for a tour because that school's in danger of going. Um, it may, may be the last chance, and I take them and show them where the shafts were. And, um, nature's reclaimed it all. But um, they're amazed at how big an area it was. Um, but I tell them a little bit about what it was like. I don't tell them the, the, the real gory details. There was some tragedies. Um, but the, uh, to be with them at the weekend was what we wanted. I can't remember as a little lad down there, when I look back as a kid, I would hate to think my grandson went down there at 15. I can't remember ever once being treated kindly by any coal miner adult. They were helpful, friendly, they wanted to know you, they wanted to be friends. And at the weekend, drinking underage, we'd gone down to the pub at, uh, at Sunnyside and meet them. And it was a laugh a minute, as I say, that's all I could talk about was work, 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 work. But they were great colleagues and I'm quite political, but I think one of the nastiest statements anybody could make about the coal mine community was when Thatcher called him the enemy within. I think that was dreadful, absolutely dreadful. I didn't like that before. I hated that even more after that, because they certainly weren't. Um, but it, <clears throat> the life wasn't for me. It wasn't because of the hard work. It was, I wanted to see more, and I wanted to talk more <laughs> about the work. And, um, one night, a friend, one night shift down the pit. And we used to walk up from Sunnyside to the coal mine. One o'clock in the morning, our night shift started. And I remember going up there at 16 years of age, one in the morning. You wouldn't dare let a kid go up there now. And on the way up, he said, I'm fed up with this. He said, oh, I'm going to join the Navy. I said, hmm, it's up to you. He said, will you come over with us? Because I'm a bit nervous. I said, yeah. So I went over to Castle on the Friday morning up to the recruiting centre of Westgate Road. And when we left there, I was in the Marines and he hadn't joined up. Uh, they didn't want him. And a recruiting sergeant just shouted at me, you'll make a good Marine, come with me. And I was usually jumping when somebody said jump. And I came out and went home and told him, my father went mad. <laughs> but that, that was what I wanted. Um, because oh, he'd got you the job in the first place, hadn't he? Well, he didn't have an easy job, he's a bricklayer. And I'll tell you another story about down the pit. The pony putters were paid piecework. You went to the pit and you got a bunch of tokens. Just a number string cord with a, a, a disc on with a number. That was your number. You picked up your number, put it on your belt. And when you brought a full tub out, you put it on onto the cord truck. And that was logged as your job. If it was a tub full of stone, which had still taken as much work, you got nothing. Neither did the guy who hewed it. They got nothing for stone, even though it was as much work. And um, because I wasn't that keen of the job, I didn't really throw my heart and soul into that pony putting. And uh, one Friday night, father came in and uh, said to me, I've been talking to your boss, Sammy Prim, they call him, you're a hell of a mouth. Um, deputy, and he says, all the lads are making twice what you're making because you're idle and uh, get to work and you start earning. So I went and soon I went down, I said, Sammy, what do you tell me follow that for? He said, I had a pain too much. He said, I'm sorry, son, I'll help you, he says. So for the rest of the week, he had me run backwards and forwards. He was unhooking for us, pushing the tubs. And uh, the following week when I got the wage, I was 16 year old, 1956, I had £18 wage, imagine that, £18. I was proud as punch, took it in, I said, there I'm on, there's me, 
which was over the moon. I never had as much money in that in my life. <coughs> and uh, my father came in, payday, got his pay packet out. And my mother says to him, pick my pay packet up. He says, look what he's earned. He says, how much? 18 quid? He says, it's a bloody disgrace that a chick of a kid can make that much. So I couldn't, I couldn't win. I couldn't win. <laughs> that was a day. Uh, I ended up working in that factory with him uh, after I left the Marines, short time fortunately. But um, so basically that's it uh, on the coal mine side. It was tough, it was hard, um, but it, it done me good in that when I joined the Marines, I was really strong because of all the lifting and put and the fit. So that life was no problem to me, but I've seen kids who've been in offices and they found it difficult to cope. Mm. So in that way it set me up for that, that job and I enjoyed it because genetically it would be there because most of our family had military service, regular military service. So I signed on for nine years and uh, when you finish training the less physically fit ones were put on ship as ship's marines, the better physically equipped went to commando and I spent the rest of the time with commando, mm -hmm. the different units, 40, 41, 42, 45, HQ 3rd, um, over at Singapore. So I spent my time from commando to commando mm -hmm. and, and enjoyed it. Just just quickly going back a little bit to man, you said, did, did you work as a cut, um, on the cutting machine? On the, oh, on the cutting machine? No, I didn't. I on wasn't old enough. I, um, by then, we, we had to uh, again keep timber leading and be at the belt end helping me to the coal trucks would pull, you would bump them out with an empty one and then you would have a hauler, take all the full ones away, drop empty ones down. It was like a rotation from the the cutting uh, the, the, the coal cutter. Um, two reasons were not allowed on were too young and the other long term men wouldn't have allowed it because it was big money. It was just like a series of blades going like that, advancing, and then blades higher into the coal instead of them sitting like this. Um, it brought back dangers, and it was still low seam, very low seam, or lying down, doing it. And uh, it was arduous. How many coal cutters would there have been? One, one on the coal face. Just one, yeah. Just one on the coal face. It's a huge machine, and they used to have anchors and pulley wheels, and there were pull it along as it was carving up, then they would have to put in the timbers <coughs> which we brought to them. Eventually they got steel props which they pumped up but that was um, coming towards the end of my time. We used to bash the timber and pour steam. And did they have, were the ponies there throughout the whole time you were there? The ponies were on a different level, they were what was called the main hook coal, the hutton seam and that was nearer the surface. And they, they want the coal face as such, the, um, the what's called, we call them kebbles. The real world was cobbles. And the cobble was sort of a, it would be, could be anything to that height. It was certainly high enough for you to work upright and hand hew. We called it hand hewing. And my job as a putter would be to have an empty tub there for him. He would hand hew it, fill that tub. And then I had to be there to take that full tub out, put an, an empty one in and get the full tub back to the conveyor end and bring another empty one in. Have you ever heard the phrase, the place is like a rolly off? Very well, up in the northeast, if you said that to anybody, they would say, God, it's not that bad, you know, a tip, uh, awful, rubbish everywhere. And the term rolly off came from, we well, had a, rolly, a rolling off. And we used to say rolly off because there was only one track led to the coal hewer. So obviously if you took an empty one in it had to get out the way. And you had a, a B, a space back, and you used to tip it over off the rails so it fell into the air. And of course any residue in it fell out and you had all kinds in. And then uh, you went and pulled the full tub out, stopped pull the empty one back on, take it in. And that place, which was such a mess, was called a rolly off. And the main community, still, if you meet any of the oldies, that's like a rolly off in here. So if you ever hear it, that's what it is. And was there a, 
a, a social club attached to the... Yeah, well, the, 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 well the miners themselves contributed to uh, to uh, have built the miners' welfare hall at Marley Hill. Um, great success it was used for social functions, pantomimes every year, the school children used it, it had a snooker room upstairs, <coughs> and of course, with the demise of the coal industry, that was it. But the council took it over and it's now a community centre where all kinds goes on, dance schools, my own granddaughter went there um, and progressed on to, to London. So it's still in use, which is good. But thanks to the coal mine fraternity, the Federation Brewery was formed, Northern Clubs Federation Brewery. And um, men everywhere were wanting their own club. This is another story, I've done a big history on that. Um, but uh, Sunnyside Social Club was built and that's where we all went to. There's a couple of pubs up the road that would start off there, have a warmer up, a pint, and then walk down to the club and they would play dominoes, cards, darts, even bingo, God save me. But um, still there, beautiful club, but like all clubs in danger. But we, we as a history society put a canny bit across the bar, thankfully. So it's a beautiful club, yeah. So, and it was really sort of a, a high, you know, hub of the community, sort of. Sorry? It was, was it quite a hub of the community in its yes, day? Yes, very much so, it was full. You had to queue outside at Christmas and New Year to get in. And whenever you went down, lunchtime or night time, it was full of miners either coming off shift or going on shift. Because in them days you didn't, you didn't have to run home with your paper packet unopened. You, you, what you used to do, someone was take the helmet off, take so much money out of it, put it in the helmet before the bus and went home like that. And that was that keepy box. That was that keepy box was seen as the right. And the wives never seen a pay note. Come in. Running again. Right. I know um, you, know, you spent time in the Marines, and you were, when you were leaving, you, it was the police you were going to go to, That's wasn't right. it? But then, as as the job, then they had a bit of a freeze on the recruiting, That's right. That's right. so you got a temporary job at the steel factory. It was, it was called Hugh Wood and Ellis. It used to be owned privately by the Ellis family, and then Hugh Wood, which was a famous name in uh, steel making, <laughs> had a, actually had a factory on the team valley. They bought it off them and it was then called Hugh Wood and Ellis. And my father worked there and when I left the Marines I went straight to Market Police uh, Station. At <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. <coughs> at Market Street. <coughs> and um, he said, oh God, he said, I, I would love to take you immediately. I think that was back end of November. He said, come back in January, will you? would take you straight on. He says, you, you not need a lot of training with your background. So my dad got us this job because I, we needed to live, you know. And um, they used to do uh, welding, producing all kinds of steel things for the factories for coal mining. And they gave me a job as a miller. And a mill, milling machine was, it, it took the top off any, anything you put in, any kind of sheet. And my job was to put in these huge steel sheets. And um, the, uh, they had to go on a press first, a huge press, they would put it in, and the press would turn it so it was wavy. Then they came to me and I had to put it in the milling machine, set it away, and the milling head had hundreds of cutters, and as the sheet, the sheet went through, it milled the top flat. And uh, you had to do so many hundred of them a day. Um, if you wanted to go to the toilet, you had to ask permission, and the, oh, the boss would come and he would look at his watch and say, Where are you getting this here? And if you're more than a few minutes, he would say, Where the hell have you been? Get this bloody machine going. So I was in a hurry this day, and the back of the machine used to get covered with little scraps of steel, which you would imagine. And I had a brush, but like Philip Snell did in the coal mine. I did that, and I had gloves on, and unfortunately the milling machine caught the glove, pulled my hand in, and it tore out that part of my hand, taking all the nerves and everything with it. And uh, that was it, I, I couldn't work, and I went to the guy on the other milling machine, said I've got to have a bad accident, he nearly fainted. 
Oh, good God, he said, when I looked down, you could see a V cut out. <laughs> it looked terrific. It looked worse than it was. Oh, I said, you have to go out and get help. And I felt really poor, you know. And I was walking out on my own, a long walk to first aid. And this welder, God bless him, seen us and he came running over and he got a hold of my arm. He said, oh my God. He shot at one of the other lads and they got a hold of my arms. And I told them where to push, because I'd done a lot of medical stuff in the Marines. And uh, to stop, I'll stem it a bit till I got to the first aid station and then it was hospital immediately and uh, I think it was 70 odd stitches I had. Of course I pulled everything out and the finger and side of the hand was numb. So that was the end of being in the police force. My dream was to teach police how to use weapons and hopefully go out and use them myself against some of the people I see on the street. Um, and that's how I ended in the Federation Brewery because a friend of my father's um, said, look, I'll get you a job at the Fed Brewery. I said, I want to work in the brewery. I'll get you one, he says. And uh, I was there 33 years and I worked right through. I started cleaning vessels, standing a vessel and I was thinking, and dignity of NCO, bloody first class weapons and struck, I ended up standing doing this. And the brewer got like me for some reason and he says, you work, you'll go. And in the end I ended up running the whole broom process. And then uh, they come along and said, uh, we're going to automate the brewery, the brew house. I said, well how the hell are you going to do that? Because it's all, well he said, it's going to be computerised. Now he said, if you help me, we've got a job for you. If you don't, we'll make you redundant. So I had to automated and as such the computer boffins came in with computers and I had to uh, tell them the process um, i.e. if I had to knock a switch off and they would put it and went on and on like that and taking dips and everything and they were sitting on that and I did this and I did this and then the first day I had to go in to put it all into the huge computer in the computer room the first day they said, right, come in, stand and watch it. If there's a mistake, tell us. And I went in with them and uh, I stood and watched the process start up. And then I went to do that and it beat us to it. And then I would go to do that and it beat us to it. And the whole thing was computerised. Run by men for all them years. And a computer then knocked things off, opened valves, which we had to do like that. Um, absolutely amazing, but the head brewer said you've done a wonderful job there. Um, it couldn't have been done but for your expertise. So he said I'll give you a job <laughs> on the new robotic keg plant. It was dreadful. They used to forget where they were going, they used to bump into each other. Have you seen them doing the paint spraying on adverts? Mm -hmm. oh, they used to bump into each other, forget where they were going, they used to drop things and uh, they had me around the bend. I absolutely hated it. And in one uh, back shift I was standing and they bumped into each other and I went forward to pull a switch. And what I didn't know, the young forklift kid had put a pallet down behind his wall and noisy didn't he? And I stepped back and went back over, the uh, knock was out a bit and that finger, the same one, ended up down here and uh, made things even worse. So they said once I'd been through all the treatment I needed etc. They said uh, we'll kind of keep you at the brewery and sure as wouldn't allow it. Uh, they wanted me out because I was trade union secretary of the management branch mm -hmm. and I'd been trade union chairman of the shop floor branch and uh, I now know why they wanted me out because they wanted a shot of the place. Mm -hmm. um, that's my assumption. But that was the end. 62 wasn't it mate? 62, yeah 62 when I finished the brewery. So it was the same the same accident same really. Same hand, same thing. That was down here and uh, of course I still have difficulty gripping mm. and uh, in the cold especially. So obviously I couldn't. Uh, they said, you know, I, right, we'll try and find a job for you but it won't be managerial. And none of the snobbery I said no because I'd seen uh, a supervisor demoted and I'd say why. And he was tread like dirt. Now I got on well with most of the guys, and I, I, maybe that wouldn't have happened to me, but 
I didn't want to risk that. And I said, no, I'll go. And uh, I left. And that was the end of my working career. Wait, when the computers came in, and it, obviously it was progress, but it lost a lot of jobs. How many, how many men's jobs did the computer now do? Oh, God, no, you asked me. <clears throat> there used to be 600 of us shop floor. That was it, the old brewery, new brewery, including transport, the garages and everything. But to actually work the plant at uh, the old brewery, you're talking about a handful each shift. Um, because even before it was computer automated, it was still pretty efficient. But then when uh, we went to the new brewery at Dunstan, um, jobs were lost. Uh, mine, I was a key worker at the old brewery. And my friend Jim Nagel, the head brewer, sent for me, right, he says, I know you're chairman of the trade union. I know that if you want to be promoted, some wouldn't like it. But he says, unless you take a managerial post, you're going to lose your job, you'll be redundant. Your job doesn't exist. So, family comes first, and uh, I was promoted to a supervisory position. Uh, some of the lads didn't like it. I heard some even say trader. And I used to say, some trader, you've got the best working conditions you've ever had in your life. You've got the best wages in the brewing industry, thanks to this trader. And uh, most of them were all right. And uh, that's when Jim, the reason he needed me and others was to beef up the managerial team, send half of it to the new brewery to get that run and keep the old one, and us to get the no that one over there. And when we actually closed the old one, a lot of the supervisors went as well, because there were no jobs for them. And I suppose to run the shift plant, you had one man run the uh, computer room. Um, there was one man doing the brewing process, which was me and shift colleagues. You had a couple of workers with you. Christ, when I'm looking back to run it, not including your kegging, not including your bottling, to just produce a brew, you'd be talking about 20 men or so, I suppose, uh, to run the, the computer plant. It was uh, absolutely brilliant, really. Mm -hmm. And how did you how did you first get involved with um, the trade union? Well, when I when I moved um, from the steel factory and I went into the Federation Brewery, I was quite astounded at the way it was run. Nepotism was a norm. Foreman would give their own brother or son a overtime job or a good job. Um, there was no justice. Uh, if somebody didn't like their face, they were sacked. And um, the shop steward was in tow with the management, so was the branch secretary. And the shop steward didn't get his own way once. He said, I'm resigning. So as soon as he resigned, the lad said to me, well, you put up, um, you know, you know what you're talking about, you're not frightened or anything like that. And I said, well, not really, but I will put up and try to get some justice, and uh, just temporarily. Of course, as soon as I put up, the other one who resigned put up, and went round collecting in, and uh, the, uh, they actually voted him back on. And th th that didn't bother me, but they voted him back on. But then the branch chairman of the um, shop floor union, he, he left. Um, again, I'll not tell you why. and. I put up for branch chairman. And the first thing I did was get stuck into the management, um, telling them safety things were needed. Where guys were squeezing past a wall, where there was a, a conveyor belt running around a million miles an hour and going past one after one. No guards or nothing on. And a lot more than that. Safety comes first, get that done, or the men on gun me. They'd never been spoken about before like that before, the board of management. And uh, <laughs> they didn't like it, but they done the job. And uh, I then went to the pay office, a friend of mine was there, and I said, can you show me the other book? And uh, I looked through it, and the highest overtime workers were the branch officials of the trade union. All the rest were getting nothing, including, they wouldn't let me stay overtime for months because they said I was a new starter. There was nothing in the book. 
And when I said then, well, I'm not putting up with this, oh, I read, he said, okay then, he says, you can come in. And I went to individual trade union members, they played hell because I've seen the figures. And uh, in the end, uh, the lads were 100% behind me and uh, we went on strike once, a week strike, which I was against, I voted against, but it was blamed for. And we got everything we wanted, 